Aristotle's Lysistrata is a play which pits men against women. It pits them against each other physically, it pits them against each other ideologically. And in doing so, it's a play which pushes at one of the great fault lines that runs through Athenian democracy, and that is the profound exclusion of women that lay at the heart of the Athenian democratic process. Athens was a culture that discriminated against women. It didn't allow them to participate in the political process, but more than that, it excluded them from the economic life of the city. Women, for example, were not allowed to make contracts worth more than a worth more than a bag of barley. Women lived in a permanent state of guardianship. From the moment they were born, they were under the control of their fathers. When they were married, they were handed over, like some chattel, into the hands of their husbands, who controlled all the important decisions that regulated their lives. It's an extraordinary state of exclusion. And deep down, Athenian men knew it was wrong. They knew that this was arbitrary decision. They knew it was a capricious decision. And in some ways, the role of Athenian ideology was to kind of paper over the cracks, to make them forget just how unjust this state of affairs was. So Athenian myth, for example, constantly tells Athenian men that women are dangerous, that they need to be under control. Think, for example, of myths like the Pandora myth, which shows how all evil originates from the curiosity of women. Think about the monstrous women like Medusa that can turn you to stone. There was one myth in particular that the Athenians loved telling, and that was the myth about the time that the warlike Amazons invaded Athens and the Acropolis. Indeed, in the Lysistrata, when the Athenian audience sees the women seizing the Acropolis, it's likely that many of them would have thought back to this myth. This myth about these strange warlike women who had conquered almost the, the known world from Scythia all the way through to Greece. Almost the entire world, but Athens. And it's in Athens that they're finally put back in their place. It's the Athenians led by Theseus that defeat the Amazons and send them back to Scythia. This was a story that the Athenians loved telling. It's a story that we find on the sculptures of the Acropolis. It's a story we find on the shield of the great Chris Elephantine statue, the gold and ivory statue of Athena Parthenos. We find it also on all sorts of domestic pottery. It's a story the Athenians love telling. It's a story that tells you about how what makes an Athenian man is one who can put uppity women back in their place. But it's not just myth that the Athenians relied on to justify their exclusion of women. From almost the moment they're born, Athenian men are taught about the deficiencies of women, in particular their irrationality, and even more importantly, their lack of self-control. The play Lysistrata picks up on this idea. In the play we see women you know, with lacking self-control in all sorts of ways. They're devotees of drink, they can't get enough alcohol. More importantly, they're devotees of sex. We need to be clear here. It's not love they're looking for, but pure physical passion. And so when we look at Athenian women and the oversex women of Lysistrata, we're seeing reflected a lot of the male preconceptions about women. It plays on the Athenian fears about adultery. Men were always worried that their wives were entertaining lovers. Well, so far, the picture that I've painted is a rather bleak one. It's one of men and women at each other's throats. It's one of antipathy, not respect or affection. And yet this isn't the whole picture. When we look at Athenian attitudes to women, we see both this extraordinary misogyny, but we also see moments of deeper love, deep affection and deep respect. Indeed, the Athenians seem to be kind of schizophrenic in some ways. That is, that when they talk about women in general, they're often extremely misogynous. But ask them to talk about specific women, ask a man to talk about his wife or his daughters, and he suddenly changes his tone. Here we see signs of affection, love and respect. And in many ways, Lysistrata reflects this schizophrenic attitude. Here we see despicable, disgusting women, but also this picture is shot through with powerful women, respectful women. 
there's no one who's more kind of uh, respected and, and you know, comes out as a stronger figure than the figure of Lysistrata in this play. She's a play who stands up to men, who speaks truth to power. Her speeches are extraordinary. She turns, for example, the silence of women into a remarkable case of self-control. You think women don't have self-control, she says? Well, try be silent during times of war, watching your husbands and sons die. She turns the silence of women into a virtue, into this more extraordinary a case of self-control, the very virtue that men said women lacked. She also turns women's work, the act of weaving, of, of kneading wool, into an extraordinary political metaphor. As she turns in the play, challenged to explain the uh, ability of women to rule the state, uh, she turns to the act of wall making and she shows how this act of wall making can be turned into a powerful political metaphor. There's nothing like Lysistrata in uh, Athenian comedy. She stands unique. She's remarkable, persuasive, compelling. She's so compelling, someone has even argued that Lysistrata is a pro-women play. For me, that's going too far. And I think if we needed a reminder about the agenda of the Lysistrata, then we just need to look at the end. Because what the play celebrates at the very end is the return to the status quo. Peace is restored, husbands and wives united, and everything goes back to normal. It's a play in love with the normal, in love with the status quo. For all the radical politics it entertains, ultimately it undercuts it at the end.